Uh, my name is Sonny. Uh, I work primarily, mostly on Cosmos, but I uh, do a bunch of other stuff. I run a podcast called Epicenter, uh, run some validators. But today I'll be talking about something that has nothing to do with any of those things. Uh, I'll be talking about some just ideas in monetary stuff that I've been exploring lately, and another project that I'm really into, which is called Interledger. I don't really work on it in any active sense, but I'm uh, just gonna share some cool things about it and why I think it's very important in the uh, scope of monetary policy or monetary evolution. Um, so uh, a lot of the ideas that I'm gonna share today uh, come heavily from uh, these two sources, one is from the, uh, this course on Coursera called Economics of Money and Banking, and the other is from uh, a blog by, uh, called Moneyness by J.P. Koning, a uh, great economist. Uh, you, should, you guys should all go follow his blog. It's amazing. Um, and he has a lot, of, a lot of opinions on Bitcoin and whatnot as well. So you, you guys, if any of you are active on crypto Twitter, you probably interact with him at least one point. Um, so, okay, so we'll talk about what, what I want to... What, essentially what I want to try to answer in this uh, talk is, what is money? And so, you know, commonly we use this, you know, these three things, like store value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. But I would say that, like, you know, following this rule, like, you know, we can basically call anything a, a money, right? Like, I don't think this is a good enough definition. So I'm going to make the claim that bananas are amazing money because, look, like, you know, th th they act as a great store of value. You can last on two or three months in, in your freezer. Um, you, you can, act, you, I, 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 just this morning, I traded someone a banana for an apple. They, they accepted the trade. It's medium of exchange. There's no reason I can't price thing in things in bananas. Like, you know, it, it, it's kind of weird, but you can do it. Um, it's, it's also a unit of account, you know, if you ever know the internet meme, like banana for scale. So, you know, it's clearly a unit of account for not just money, but also for length. And, you know, you might be like, oh, but social consensus says bananas aren't money. Well, you know, that's where you're wrong. So, social consensus has said bananas are money. Um, so, clear, but, you know, somehow this feels intuitively wrong. Like, bananas don't seem to be money. And so, you know, what's going on here? I, I think what we can see is if we look at this, like, you know, this is a, a categorization of different types of assets, right? And you'll see that there, nowhere in this is there a categorization called money. Like, you know, different assets have, like, you know, uh, they could be liabilities, debt instruments, commodities, uh, whatnot, but there's no, nothing called money. And so, what I would claim is money is not a noun. Money is an adjective to describe an asset. It's a, pro it's a property of an asset rather than a category of an asset. And m more importantly, it is a spectrum. And like, you know, bananas might be, like, you know, they might have like some level of moneyness, but clearly they don't have very high moneyness. And so the question then is, what is this spectrum? What is it measuring? You know, there's these three, categories, it could be measuring all three of the, you know, some of these might be even orthogonal to each other. And I'd say, you know, the one that seems the most out of place is store value, right? For example, you know, maybe gold is a better store value, but intuitively it feels like it has worse moneyness. Or maybe, you know, S&P 500 is a better store value than U.S. dollars. But somehow that also feels like it has uh, worse moneyness. So I think what we can see here is it probably has something to do more with the medium of exchange and, and the unit of account. But uh, which one of these two? So one thing I would say is, look, we have all of these assets, uh, you know, whether it's Federal Reserve notes, coins, federal, uh, like deposits at bank deposits, whatnot. The, these all are different assets that are stable against the unit of account, which is the dollar. The dollar is not a asset. It's a unit of account, and we have many assets that trade at par with the dollar. And so that, that maybe makes us think, like, okay, maybe it has to do with the unit of account. But the problem is, even the dollar is a price. Like, you know, there's, there's a price of dollars. And in fact, there's, you know, multiple prices of dollars. There's four main prices. There's par, interest, interest rates, exchange rate, and price level. So, you know, dollar, the par is a, uh, a dollar asset to another dollar asset. Are they trading at par? Interest rate is current dollars to future dollars. Exchange rate is dollars to other monies, or other currencies, and price level is dollars to commodities. So, but the problem here, that, that, that implies that if 
if this thing has a price, then what is the price based on, right? Like, it has to be based somehow on supply and demand that this price is coming from. And so, the supply and demand of what, right? You can't, you can't just say that this is the price and, um, so it can't be measuring just the unit of account. The, what, the, 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 the unit of account price comes from the supply and demand measurements of the assets that we call money. And so what assets do we call money? It has to do with the assets that are most heavily used as a medium of exchange. So uh, this is a quote from J.P. Koning, where a more money-like instrument is re relatively more tradable or marketable than a less money-like instrument. And I think that is what defines money. It's how easy is it for you to dishoard an asset in exchange for something else you want. Primarily, it has to do with the liquidity and the acceptability of that asset. How easy is, it, it, it's an instrument of persuasion. How easy is it for you to persuade someone to do something you want in exchange for this asset? So how easy it is to dishoard. And so, you know, on the moneyness scale, clearly bananas are pretty low. And, you know, you have, you know, uh, $20 bills may be pretty high. And we can see even within Federal Reserve notes, like, you know, maybe the moneyness of some assets is, hard, is, is higher or lower. Like, sometimes, you know, especially in Berkeley, you, you know, that we use a lot, a lot of stores use cash, but they'll say like, oh, you know, we're not gonna take a $100 bill. And so it is actually harder for you to dishoard a $100 bill than it is to, for you to dishoard a $20 bill. And so that actually shows even within like a single class of asset, there is, uh, uh, varying degrees of moneyness. Um, gift cards are another example. Gift cards, you know, have pretty, have lower moneyness because they are pretty, you know, acceptable and you can get them for anything you want, but only in very low places. And even within gift cards, you know, for example, maybe an Amazon gift card probably has way higher moneyness than, you know, a, a, a Chipotle gift card, because you can only dishoard a Chipotle gift card for a burrito, while an Amazon gift card you can kind of dishoard for anything you want. This implies that it has higher moneyness. Land, land I mean, land is a great example of something that probably has great store value, but very low moneyness. It's very difficult for you to dishoard land in exchange for something else. Um, and even within like the assets we call uh, uh, moneyness, like you know, we have different types of um, it, it, within the assets we call like government money, we have different types of um, moneyness. And so what, what defines uh, what will become a good asset, an asset with high moneyness? These are some examples of useful properties. Like, so these properties aren't what define something's moneyness, but it's rather that these are things that maybe assets who have all these properties tend to have high moneyness. And so stability, ease of transfer, liquidity, durability, usefulness, fungibility, divisibility, and privacy. And so, you know, I would say today most of these cryptocurrencies like Ether, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, you know, I think Bitcoin has slightly high, high the highest moneyness, Dogecoin probably not so much, Ether somewhere in the middle, but you know, th these clearly don't have that high moneyness. And why is it that they don't have it? Um, you know, I think they, end up satisfying almost most of these properties, right? But I would say that the two that they don't really, uh, one is privacy, but I think, uh, you know, we're getting there eventually. But the other is stability. I, I mean, I think that the way, uh, this is like sort of another talk, if you wanna come to, oh, actually I'll mention it later, but um, I think that what they really fail on is the stability aspect and any like system that, you know, if you want, how fiat currencies work is they're designed such that any fluctuations in demand are met with a fluctuation in supply to, to change the quantity of money in order to keep price, the price of money somewhat stable. And I think until we get cryptocurrencies that can kind of incorporate such uh, feedback mechanisms, uh, I don't think we're ever gonna have, real, I, I don't think Bitcoin and Ether will ever really become stable enough to actually get high enough moneyness. Um, but that's sort of another topic for another time. Um, what I do wanna talk about then is yeah, so we, you know, we got to balance the elasticity and discipline. So now what my, my claim here is I think what we can do is if we can have a way to increase this a lot, give almost any asset a lot of these properties, I think we can increase the moneyness of all assets, and so the, or at least all digital assets. And so this is where the interledger protocol comes in. 
where, so for people who aren't too familiar with Interledger, um, I'll give a very, very brief explanation of it. Um, so what you have to know is this is what the Lightning Network looks like. It's very, um, you know, you have these HTLCs where you have to do, they have this complex mechanism where you pass on the uh, hash and then you have to pass on the pre-image and then the payment goes through in an atomic way. Uh, has a lot of bugs and problems with it where like you can DOS it for free with no cost to you. Um, and so to solve that problem, the Interledger system was invented. And so part of the problem here is this slide deck is in PDF form and it was supposed to be in PowerPoint and so I had animation. So I'll kind of have to explain what was happening in these animations without the actual animations happening. But essentially what would happen is, let's say you wanted to send over one Bitcoin. Uh, Alice wanted to send one Bitcoin to Eric. What, sh what she would do is she would send maybe one, some small amount, let's say one Satoshi at a time or 10 Satoshis at a time and basically stream payments. And when Eric receives the first Satoshi, he'll send an act to Alice, and then she'll go ahead and send over the next Satoshi. And you kind of just continuously just keep streaming this until the entire payment ends. And let's say Carol in the middle, she's like one of the people who's in the middle of this process, she decides to be malicious and you know run away with the funds. Worst case, she gets away with one Satoshi of funds, which is like, Eh, you know, maybe it's okay to, for the efficiency purposes, it's probably okay to just extend a line of trust for a couple of Satoshi, and if, if they run away, no big deal. Now, what's cool about this is when you do this, you can also get into the point where you start to app put like market makers in the middle. So maybe Carol isn't just, you know, making, doing like Bitcoin to Bitcoin, maybe she's actually, you know, Alice wants to pay in Bitcoin and Eric wants to receive an Ether, and so, yeah, I see the animations at work. But um, this, in this system, what you could do is maybe Alice will send Carol, you know, uh, five Satoshi, and then Carol will send Eric like one way or something. Way is the smallest unit of uh, ether. And so you can just do this sort of string process until the entire payment goes through. And so what's cool about um, how Interledger is designed is it's not really cryptocurrency specific. It was, you know, designed with cryptocurrencies in mind, but it wasn't the sole use case. And so it's re you, really what you can think of Interledger as is an open payments API. And so you can kind of integrate it with any sort of settlement layer. And so some of the settlement layers that people have already built is they've built, you know, things like, you know, e Ethereum payment channels, like so the Connect channels. People have built uh, in p settlement layers on Bitcoin Lightning channels. Uh, people have built settlement layers on, you can use a, you can even use a fast, if you have a fast base layer, you could use that. So for example, a, a, a Tendermint based chain, you know, if you have like one, one to two second blocks, you can use that as a settlement layer. Or you can even use things like Venmo and PayPal and people have built integrations of Interledger into these uh, systems. And so that means that let's say I want to pay in Bitcoin and it's, I'm streaming Bitcoin and whoever's receiving, they're receiving streaming payments on Venmo or, or uh, PayPal or whatever US dollar system that they want. And so what this does is it increases the moneyness of all assets because it makes it very easy for me to dishoard an asset that I'm holding, as long as there is sufficient liquidity uh, of an asset that the price difference isn't too high. But I, I would say enough assets have high enough liquidity that the UX is still reasonable to be able to use it. And so my claim is that eventually what we're gonna see is Interledger kind of taking the place of the standard medium of exchange. And you know, I, I use Interledger Ledger as an example of a open payments API. It could, I'm not, I think it's a really well-designed one, but it's sort of just a stand-in that I'm using for that. And then what happens here is then it makes it easier for people to hold any sort of digital store value, whether it's like silly stuff like Bitcoin or like, you know, digital gold or, you know, eventually we might see like common stock certificates issued on, on a chain, uh, treasury bills and treasury bonds. You know, like one question would be, in a system where you, it's easy to dishoard treasury bills, why in the world would you ever want to hold treasury bill, uh, Federal Reserve notes instead of treasury bills? They seem to be strictly superior. And so in this system, we can, we can do that. But now we have a question. What happens to the unit of account? Like, okay, if we, don't have a sink, if we don't have a small set of assets acting as the primary medium of exchange, what, what, where does our unit of account come from? 
So for this, I say we should look at uh, a, a cool idea that they have implemented in Chile. And they, this is actually you know, a much older idea. This happens all the time in, in medieval times. But you know, Chile still does it up until today, where they have this uh, unit of account called the Unidad de Fermento. And what it is, is it's an index that's output by the central bank every day where it's basically based, it's tracking inflation over the last one month. And all the long-term debts in, uh, all long-term prices in Chile are denominated in UF. So the currency in Chile is called the, the Chilean peso. And so, you know, your, if you go to the store and buy like, buy a sandwich, that's gonna be, the price is gonna be in pesos. But your, your, your rent, your car payment, your mortgage, these are all denominated in UF. And so this is really cool where this is a practical example of where we have a unit of account that is completely disassociated with any asset. It's not based on supply and demand. It's actually just an index and we see it working. And so I think what we could see is in the future, hopefully central banks can sort of become these, uh, in, these institutions whose sole job is to measure the economy and output indices that you know, we, can, we can base prices off of. It'll become, le so currently central banks are very like shackled, you know, they have this job of trying to maintain stability of prices, that is their like purpose, but they do it by trying to manipulate the supply and demand of the standard medium of exchange assets. If they are, removed from that requirement, and they can just focus on outputting dictionary index of accounts, uh, unit of accounts, we can, it might be much easier. And they'll, they'll become much more like, um, you know, institution, like the, uh, I forgot what the name of that institution, but like, you know, the, the one in France that like defines what the kilogram is and whatnot, for example. And so you can kind of have systems like that where the central banks are just, you know, measuring real GDP and like velocity and all, all this stuff and just outputting these prices for the uh, economy. And so, you know, so I've had a lot of, uh, I've had some discussion with uh, J.B. Koning about this idea. And one of the uh, points that he brings up that, you know, okay, the, the, this seems to make sense, but like one of the issues I see is people don't want to, uh, pay with risky assets. So, you know, people don't want to pay with lottery tickets, for example. Like if I go into the store, like one, the merchant's gonna be like, what the hell, I don't want this. But let's say, let's say the merchant could, I could, on Interledger, I could pay with my lottery ticket and the uh, merchant can receive the um, dollars, right? But I don't want to pay with my lottery ticket because the lottery ticket, you know, to me, it's not the EV of the lottery ticket. It's like my hopes and dreams are like embedded in this lottery ticket. And so I don't want to dishoard this asset. And like the same would go for like, you know, all sorts of different assets. Like, you know, maybe uh, my common stock, like S&P 500. I, why would I want to dishoard that instead of holding it? And so, you know, my response to this would be, I think even in this, um, how good of a risky, like risk profile different people have, I think also it's different for different people. So for some people, S&P 500 might be considered their like risky asset. While for some people, that's like, oh, that's my safe asset. That's where I put stuff when I, you know, and for me, my risky asset is like Bitcoin and whatnot, right? And so I think this kind of system will still allow different people to choose different points on their uh, risk portfolios where they want to store their assets. And so, yeah. and. What I think we're essentially gonna see is, you know, the, we have this idea called the political trilemma of the uh, world economy. It's uh, by Danny Roderick. And so what we're gonna see is we have this conflict between, you know, hyper-globalization, democratic policies, and national sovereignty. And I think this is the trilemma that we should really be focused on in the crypto space. Um, and what, what this means is so you can have hyper-globalization and national sovereignty, and this is what the gold standard creates for us, where we, be, where we remove the democratic policies, and specifically what it means here is the democratic ability to affect monetary policy. So in the gold standard, you know, you ha every country has a lot of national sovereignty that, and you know, uh, a lot of hyper-globalization because prices are pretty set, but you lose out on a lot of ability to affect monetary policy. Then you can get into a system where maybe you have global governance, which is sort of what you know, Keynes suggested at Bretton Woods, at, or also what the Euro sort of is today, where it says, okay, you know, we're gonna give up on heavily on national sovereignty, but we can create 
globalization by having a single currency, and we can have democratic policies to affect monetary policy of that currency, but it has to be agreed upon by the entire bloc, not just on national sovereignty. So the democratic policies are moved to the uh, European level rather than at the national sovereignty level. Or Keynes's suggestion was sort of to move monetary policy, dis democratic decision making to the global IMF level rather than at the uh, na nation state level. And then finally, what we have today is sort of what the Bretton Woods Compromise was, which was, you know, we heavily give up on the hyperglobalization where we have like free floating exchange rates and whatnot and heavy capital controls. And so essentially, you know, yeah, so this is kind of what I, I was saying. And I think what this kind of system would do is maybe help us move a little bit towards the hyperglobalization. We have to understand that we are going to then be losing out on a lot of trade-offs um, where we might have a, a little bit less ability to do democratic policies, where if you have a pure, you know, Hayekian vision of de like denationalization of money where, you know, m monies are competing in the market, you know, maybe that makes it more difficult for governments to perform monetary policy, but maybe it, you know, it makes it easier to move towards more globalization. I, I, I don't know what the answer to this is, and I think this is a hard question, and I think this is what we should really all be thinking about. And uh, so with that regard, uh, tomorrow, uh, on Wednesday, I, I'm hosting an event uh, here in SF called macro.wtf, where we'll be exploring a lot more onto these uh, topics. So uh, I'm hosting a panel specifically about Roderick's trilemma. And so, yeah, if you can come on out, it's at 450 Townsend Street, and we'll be talking about all sorts of cool stuff. You can go to macro.wtf, that's the URL. Um, yeah, so thank you guys so much. And I think I have a... Yeah. And I think I have a lot of time, so if anyone has questions. Yeah, we have a bunch of time. So yeah. we'll start in the back, we'll work our way forward. Um, thank you for that, that was really interesting. Uh, I guess my question is similar, I think, to uh, J.P. Koning's uh, uh, cr uh, questioning. Um, and I guess, do people use, uh, I guess what did I, yeah. So do people use things with more moneyness or do things that people use gain moneyness? Because I guess like here you're kind of like creating the conditions for this and it's like, well, people are going to use it. And I could see a lot of those like, you know, fungibility, like all those things be like mm -hmm. observations of things that people happen to use. Mm. Um, I think there's a little bit of both. I mean, it is a little bit of a, there's a network, not network effect, but like cyclical effect here. Um, and I think the primary thing that affects something's moneyness is how acceptable it is. Uh, and these other properties are just about sort of what, what, what increases something's acceptability because it has good properties. Um, but honestly, I think the biggest thing that drives current demand for currencies is that it's acceptable by the government for your payment and taxes, right? And so that's what gives you know, uh, bank deposits and Federal Reserve notes the highest acceptability uh, of most assets. So that, that, so these are just some properties that can increase the moneyness of assets, but it, it, there's other things of like, you have to drive demand for assets in other ways as well. This side of the room, anyone? Come around, I'm far back, yes, back, back, back. Please. I mean, looking at the recent comments from central banks who were very, uh, afraid, I think, of Libra and what Libra uh, intended. Mm -hmm. Do you not think it's inevitable that we're going to get central bank digital currencies, mm -hmm. that these are being planned? And, you know, governments being as they are, this isn't going to be more freedom and, and, and better privacy. It's going to be worse. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I think we're totally going to see central bank digital currencies. And in a way, I'm kind of excited for it because I think it can help. Um, I think that... I mean, so this is kind of like a little bit off topic from, uh, from the point from this presentation, but I think that like, you know, back to that thing, that thing I had about elasticity and dis discipline, I think what central bank digital currencies can do is provide more discipline to the system. Um, and so, you know, I think more like blockchains can enforce more rules-based monetary policy rather than discretion-based. And I think we can also get into like, I think some of the technological efficiencies could be really cool. So, you know, Here's an example, you know, back, so today, okay, so there's this idea in um, 
you guys are probably all familiar with uh, like the reserve requirement that banks have. In, today we do something called contemporaneous reserve accounting, where banks, what they have to do is at the, every two weeks, they basically have to say that, look, based off of your balance deposits that you've had over the last two weeks, you need to meet the reserve, you have to have the, the average of that, you have to have the reserve requirement, let's say it's 10% of that at, at the checkpoint time. But what this allows is the banks are just basically lend freely and then come the checkpoint time, they just end up being able to borrow from the Fed because the Fed doesn't want them to like default either and so they just, it's, the, the reserve requirement isn't actually add, adding that much discipline to the system. Back in the 80s, they tried something called contemporaneous reserve accounting where they said at any given moment, you need to have the right amount of reserves, but it was an accounting nightmare. You just, the technology at the time just couldn't keep all these books in sync and you just couldn't, the contemporaneous system just didn't work. But maybe today with blockchains and distributed systems, maybe we can achieve things like this. And so I think that that's just, that's just like one toy example of like things that, through, that central bank digital currency might still be able to help us provide more discipline to the monetary systems today. Great question so far. Come right up here. Uh, you have mentioned uh, Chile Nuefa, Unidad de Fomenta, as an example of a unit of account which doesn't change uh, purchase value over time. The inflation, though, like it's very convenient mechanism uh, for a government or like an institution who control monetary policy to do two things. One of them to do additional taxation uh, for a population of people. Another one to stimulate economy because without inflation, if you hold a lot of money, you do not have a strong incentive to reinvest it. So it's actually bad for economy as we see like in Japan, it's basically like a time bomb. So could you please explore more? What did you mean exactly with uh, this uh, different unit of account when do inflationary dollar? Yeah, I mean, I'm not making any claims that what the uh, UF, its algorithm is correct, where like you, you want prices to solely be based off of inflation. I'm, I, I, I was using it more as an example of a dictionary unit of account, and I think that it'll be cool to see more research into more advanced dictionary units of account. And I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I, I, I'm generally a believer in like NGDP targeting, where, where like you don't, want to target stable in prices, but rather you want to try to stabilize spending. And so creating uh, prices that kind of take it, like you want inflation that's caused by changes in supply in the economy, you don't want to correct for those. You want to correct for changes in inflation caused by changes in demand. And so that, that so you know, you could read a lot of uh, Scott Sumner's work on this, uh, but so yeah, that's my point. I mean, like, you know, I want I want to see more research on kind of people outputting different uh, uh, unit, dictionary units of account and see how that works. Not that the Chilean pesos, uh, the, the UF one is the best one possible. Another one right around here. Yes. Thank you, Sonny, you're doing great. And, and so, so, uh, so the, like, you know, a government, a, a central bank might output a dictionary unit of account that is like, you know, takes into account perhaps its, uh, other political goals, for example, and it could maybe take into use inflation, like add some inflation or whatnot into that. It just, it, it's up to the, what the central bank wants to do. I personally prefer a more rules-based system, so we remove that discretionary aspect. But maybe some central banks might want to do that. Got one more right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you uh, spoke about it a little bit right there, but kind of uh, you talked about discipline versus elasticity, um, and maybe it's better for a central bank to control that. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on um, interest rates and whether you like think it's still best for a central bank to control that versus like a, you know, a group of people. And also like how you envision like different countries or nation states playing together and how their policies interact on any, like one another. And if like you think in the model that you're proposing, if like sovereign like currencies is still like a realistic thing because a lot of like interest rates play off of each other, especially when talking about like USD and the Euro, right? Yeah. So I would say, sorry, your first question was, yeah, I mean, I think what's going to happen is you're gonna, different assets are going to have, like, you know, their own markets for interest rates, right? And then the, about how, like, different currencies uh, do it, I mean, this is kind of what I was saying, like, it does, if it, you make it too easy for the government, for, like, people to use, like, it comes down to the Roderick's dilemma, right? Where, like, as we increase the, you know, 
ability to use any asset. We've removed the ability for any one government to like have to provide a lot of uh, mo like monetary policy because it's too easy to not use that government's con condoned asset. You can use another asset to transact. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the trade-off that we have to decide. Is that what we want to go towards or not? Um, what, I mean, but the easiest way for governments to still allow their monetary policy to have some effect is that you, they still tax in, uh, but denominate their taxes in their dictionary unit of account. And so that incentivizes people to hold some reserves in assets that are good at trading at par with that dictionary unit of account. Awesome. Coming up to the front, this will be our last one. So uh, the dictionary unit of account, uh, whatever it is that you're targeting, whether it's inflation or NGDP, uh, that raises the oracle problem. And saying, well, we're just going to agree on the central bank as the oracle is kind of to give up the game. Uh, do you, uh, the ideal kind of oracle would be one with balanced incentives uh, so that the uh, estimate of NGDP was an honest estimate uh, uh, and a non-manipulable estimate. Do you have any ideas on how to uh, cre arrange a set of incentives in order to get an honest estimate of either NGDP or inflation? Um, I do not, because uh, I, I mean, I've never really done a lot of economic data work. Um, but I mean, I think what we what we'd want is to make it so, like the you you can. Information about the economy should be input into functions that output policy decisions. And so really the, the Oracle problem is just about the inputting or, or gathering the data. And I think like, I, I'm really not sure, but like, you know, I would like to make sure that, you know, it should be data gathered from multiple entities, like not just one entity, like, you know, we should have multiple people reporting on like, oh, GDP, money velocity, whatnot, like, and, to be honest, no, I'm not quite sure about how to, what the best way to solve the Oracle problem here, because it's like what you're trying to measure is such a complex, like trying to get data about the entire US economy, for example, and distill it into, I'm, I'm not really sure. And maybe some other economists who do know more about this, uh, please come talk to me or come to the macro.wtf event and we can talk about it there. Cool. Okay, if we could have another, please round of applause. Thank you.